Um, on behalf of the first of the BSA, the Bibliographical Society of America, welcome. Um, thank you to the hosts of this webinar on the archaeology of reading. Um, those are Earl Havens, Matthew Simons, Neil Ware, Jacques Gerertz, and am I forgetting anyone? No, I'm not. Good. Uh, so please know that this webinar is being recorded. By joining the meeting, you automatically consent to such the recording. And if you do not consent to being recorded, please do not join the session. That said, you as a participant will not be able to speak. So if you need assistance with technical issues, um, please use the chat function. Um, that's at the bottom of your screen or at the top of the screen, depending upon where the Zoom control bar is. And just pop that out. I'm going to type a quick hello um, in there, and you should see that if you open up the chat box. So anyone can send a message to me at any time and I'll help you. I also invite you to please share your questions as they come up in the chat box. We'll be saving these for the session, the Q&A session on Wednesday morning. Um, so we really encourage you to share your questions as they come up so that they can be addressed later on. Um, now, unless, so please do continue to, um, follow along in the chat and just let me know if you have any other any issues but without any further ado I will introduce Earl Havens. Thank you Earl. Welcome. Thank you Aaron. Can can everybody hear me? Can you hear me Aaron? I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody to the Archaeology of Reading. Um, I uh, am sharing with you uh, just to start uh, a view of our website for this five-year digital project between um, Johns Hopkins University, uh, the Center for Editing Lives and Letters uh, at University College London, uh, and Princeton University Library. Um, Earl? Yeah. One second. I, you're, you're, I think you've stopped sharing your screen. Ah, I don't know how that happened. Um, Thanks for catching that. I'm trying to figure out what happened. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry for that. The, the, the uh, inevitable technical difficulties. <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, just give a kind of a general overview of this project um, with an eye towards um, addressing some of our uh, immediate thoughts and needs and concerns as scholars, as teachers, as librarians, um, rare book uh, curators, and so forth, um, about how to access um, material of great uh, research, but also teaching value within the online environment through what was originally generated as a kind of a research um, tool, but which we had already begun to adapt as a team, um, also for teaching and pedagogical purposes. Um, what began as a kind of a research enterprise um, uh, became something more like a digital research experience through the uh, creation of the Archaeology of Reading Viewer. Um, but first, in order to understand any of this, one really needs to understand um, what the project is about in terms of its content. Um, what we've really generated is a viewer. Um, this is a still image of a page from um, Castiglione's uh, Il Cortegiano in the English translation of uh, Hobie. Um, what we did was we took this as an exemplary page in this two-page poster, which can be downloaded from the website, and um, offered a kind of uh, little uh, arrows pointing out to various and sundry aspects of the idiosyncratic methods of annotation, animadversion, and interpretation, in a sense, evidence of reading practice um, of Gabriel Harvey, one of the two main figures that comprise the, the corpus of material, along with John Dee. Um, on the uh, right, you'll see what is a, the, the real core of the project, as we'll see when we open up the AOR viewer, is an annotation panel 
which uh, transcribes all of the marginalia on each page uh, and keeps those, that data integral to the digital surrogate of the image in all instances as you pass through the viewer. If you toggle to the search, you'll then find a search panel, which was an also a, a, a creation of this project, which allows you to conduct a, a multifaceted search through our um, data set, uh, the underlying data set for the archaeology of reading. What we undertook to do is to select uh, 36 uh, rare books um, from the scattered libraries of these two serial annotators of the 16th century. Um, uh, we chose Gabriel Harvey uh, and John Dee primarily because they, uh, well, in addition to having two of the largest libraries in uh, 16th century England, and in addition to always having an ink pot and a pen knife and a quill pen in hand when they read, and also evidence within their annotations that they read not just one book at a time, but that they read through many books in their library at the same time. In addition to all that, they also fulfilled the absolute requirement that they have excellent handwriting, excellent penmanship, which makes um, the archeology span of reading particularly useful across all sorts of user groups, precisely because one can read the marginalia. So we essentially digitized 36 books scattered across a dozen libraries. You cannot do this kind of research outside of a digital environment because you cannot literally put many of these books in the same room again and compare them one to the other. Um, we were interested to get beyond the sort of um, uh, one-off tradition of studying marginalia as um, how X read his or her Y as a kind of case study and allow for a much more in-depth kind of um, exploration of reading as an, as an activity of, within a library, within a collection and across space and time. Um, we chose Gabriel Harvey, who was a Cambridge Don, a would-be English courtier, whose um, marginalia very much um, fills in a, that kind of mode of a kind of early modern self-fashioning um, reader and a polymath. Uh, and then John Dee, a, a rather different figure, though, um, also undertaking this great enterprise of marginalia. Um, the proverbial magus of the Elizabethan court, the mathematician, astrologer, astronomer, uh, alchemist, and um, all around reader of the book of nature, as it were. Um, we chose books uh, it, for our canon that, um, for the Harvey, that we thought were particularly rich in their marginalia. We have, for example, Frontinus's Stratagemata of War at the Houghton Library, which is spectacularly um, annotated both the Italian uh, Cortegiano as well as the English translation I mentioned earlier, works of contemporary, contemporary political theory, um, books about jokes, um, Machiavelli's The Art of War, um, Aulus, uh, Aleus Magnus's History of the Northern Lands of Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. We then moved to add the corpus of John Dee, which is a very different corpus, but again, is quite representative of his library and also should be useful to a much wider range of people, including three works of mathematics, medieval history, astronomy, classics, uh, uh, some wonderful uh, books from the New York Society Library that Erin Schreiner actually helped us with in her former position there, um, the Gerhard Dorns and Paracelsus alchemical texts and so forth and so on. I don't really have too much time to talk about that, other than to say that um, we've covered a, a wide range of material. Now, if you go to the Archaeology of Reading website and my colleagues, who I'll introduce shortly, will be talking much more about the content here. I just want to draw your attention to, to, to one thing in particular um, in this site, which is our books and readers um, page, which actually you open up and then it takes you to individual essays for all of the books for D and Harvey's Corpora with biographies of each of these um, fascinating figures and also histories of their libraries, along with allied content about the locations of books from their libraries. And then if we enter into one of these spaces here, for example, Harvey's books, you'll see a nice gallery of each of the books uh, in the collection um, with um, bibliographical essays, 
um, that give you kind of contextual information about each one with bibliographical data. Um, but the key and core of the project is the archaeology of reading viewer. This is essentially what we built in our project utilizing the Mirador 2 um, uh, open source um, uh, API to present our digital surrogates and all of this data in one place. And so you can scroll down um, within the viewer, which is where all the action is happening, as it were, and you can um, choose. Um, on the left side of the screen, you'll see books that were annotated by Harvey, books that were by D, by those images. And I'm just going to take you through a very simple sequence of um, what you see. So here you have a gallery below. There are all kinds of different options for viewing this material in different ways. You can simply move um, uh, with arrows, but you can also move um, across um, items along the bottom of the page and so forth. So here we have, you can go full screen and you can see that we have in before us Thomas Tusser's 500 Points of Good Husbandry, um, a, a literary work of the Elizabethan period that was incredibly popular. Um, it's a typical text. You see uh, above a kind of motto, uh, gratum opus agricolis, which um, here is reflected in the annotation panel, along with an English translation. Everything that appears in a marginal form, we've uh, transcribed, uh, encoded into XML to make them searchable. And then, of course, um, translated them so that these can be really valuable to students, even those without advanced language skills in Latin, Italian, French, Greek, even a bit of Hebrew. These are all uh, languages at work in this resource. Below, you'll see Gabriel Harvey having dated, um, having the date either of acquisition or of reading. Um, you also see dynamic elements of our viewer um, uh, at work here. Um, there are image uh, adjustments. You can grayscale and other things that I don't have time to show you. But say we look at the bottom annotation here, Haywood's Proverbs. Um, here you see a, a reference um, to Haywood's Proverbs. If we toggle over to search, there's a basic and then an advanced search, and the option to search within this book. Um, so if I just type in the word Haywood, um, this is the proverbial poet and epigrammatist of the 16th century. Two references come up in this book of Tusser. The first one is the one you see. The second is this. So then it takes us to the end of the book. And there at the bottom of the page is a reference to Tusser and Haywood, poets of common life. These are both poets interested in pastoral themes. So you can then, if you wish, search in a more complex way. We could, for example, search across all the books in the archaeology of reading corpus for Haywood in the basic search function. And we then open up uh, 14 references to what uh, Harvey thought was useful for in invoking um, the identity of Haywood. If we click on to the first of these, you'll see a rather vertiginous looking annotated page from a joke book, um, Domenici e Guicciardini. Um, if you uh, rotate, this is why we did this, and you read, you'll see he shall never be at, uh, good at an extemporal descant that hath not all Haywood. And so here is a reference to Haywood in conjunction with the apothemata of Laertius and Plutarch and Marshall and so forth. So uh, we also created sort of hotspots for people, places, and books. So you could go to this transcription and translation, which also gives clues to where on the page the marginalia are. Um, you click on this. Uh, I have to exit the full screen. You click on. Haywood, and you get to search in the book or search in the collection. If we search within this one book for more Haywood, we get um, a dozen hits. So now if I want to do an advanced search, I can add a term. Let's uh, choose, for example, one of the symbols that Gabriel Harvey used. He actually had his own personal symbolic system of annotation. And here we've created filters for all of these. I'm going to choose the sun, which is a symbol very often of kingship, and conduct a search. Uh, here I come up with page 438 in the same joke book. And if I advance to that and uh, rotate the page and move in, I'll see another note here, this time in Latin. Um, and it is uh, sensi ascami 
uh, Germanicum, etc. I heard the, the Germanic discourse of Ascom with Haywood's Proverbs. And you can see, you can just sort of go down the rabbit hole, as it were, as um, our colleague Anthony Grafton um, often likes to call it this experience, um, uh, as did Lisa Jardine, um, our co principal investigators, along with myself and Matt Simons. Um, when you're done going through all of these steps, you can actually click export current research and you get this handy dandy list, which you can then export in HTML and save uh, onto your machine and you open that up and you've got a sequence of all the unique durable links for everything that you've just gone through. You could produce this, reproduce this, generate this for um, not only for teaching activities, but also for directed research. Um, all of this requires teamwork. And um, uh, if we go to your blog, you'll see that some of our members of our team, uh, Matt and, and Yap, who you'll hear from, um, also our late colleague, Lisa Jardine, a mastermind behind this, and one of many uh, graduate student research fellows who helped to transcribe and trans, uh, transform this information to searchable forms. Um, we have over 31 members of the archeological team, as we call ourselves, listed on the site. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll then proceed to the next presentations. The first is by uh, Gerhards here to the right, um, who will walk us through the AOR viewer with a more particular sense about the structured data model that underlies this uh, resource um, and also talk about data export. We'll then move to Neil Weyer, who was also a postdoctoral fellow on the project, now a curator at the University of Florida of Rare Books. He will talk to us about his preparation of pedagogical training material for the site uh, and also make some suggestions for teaching. And then finally, uh, my co-principal investigator, Matt Simons, um, will talk about um, digital research, contextualizing AOR in the context of other research allied resources online. Um, what we call, in technical jargon, um, external objects from the viewer um, that can be brought to bear to turn AOR into a bit of a diving board for directed research. And so without further ado, I'm now going to pass it on to uh, to Yal. Yes, thanks Earl uh, for that. I'm now sharing my screen. Just give me a sec. Um, yeah. Right, um, so as Earl mentioned, I'll explain uh, a bit more about the search and especially how the search relies to the uh, underlying uh, data. Um, as we captured it um, in the project. So one preliminary remark um, which would be useful is to say that um, it can be sometimes daunting for either students who are not um, uh, used to um, the historiographical field of the history of, of reading or uh, working with these resources like AOR um, because the kind of data we present and the kind of data sets we present can be quite uh, daunting because of the, the um, detailed information that we've captured. And this is really the result of, um, of a decision we took quite early in the project, namely to take a maximalist approach, which means we didn't just focus on uh, the marginal notes uh, that were made by, uh, by Harvey and Dee in their books, but we really uh, decided to capture all uh, reader interventions, as we call it, made by um, these readers. So that mentions, as you can see uh, on this page of uh, Fontana's stratagems, um, that we captured oh, the uh, marginal annotations, we captured the Mars symbol, which you can see here in the middle of the page, um, and we also captured uh, all the underscored uh, words in the print text, uh, as well as the marks which you can see here in the left margin, the plus signs and the quotation signs. Um, if you look at the transcription or annotation panel on your right, you will see that not all of this information is actually uh, displayed. So because there's only limited space in this annotation panel, we decided only to um, display the uh, symbols, as you can see here, the Mars symbol, and then and the marginal notes, their translation, and um, the other information contained within these marginal notes that we've singled out, such as the cross-reference here, uh, the people mentioned, uh, and so forth. Now, 
there are various ways to access this information and that's what I want to talk about now uh, just to offer some um, strategies ways of combining the simple search and the advanced search and also offering some shortcuts as it were to particular a particular kind of information that we've captured so Earl um, already showed the simple search how it works um, and there's one thing we should realize if we do a simple search, which is a, is a string based search, it searches for um, the original text of the marginal notes made by these two readers, uh, the text of the translation, it searches within the uh, undersc underscored words in the print text, but it also uh, searches for all the text associated to all the reader interventions. So for instance, if a transcriber uh, was looking at this page and thought uh, a clear link could be established between say a plus sign in the, in the left margin and a part of the printed text, he or she would capture that in the XML files in which we make our transcriptions. And this information is searched as well. So it can happen that if you do a basic search for a particular word, that you that the search result will yield pages which don't have marginal annotations but you but which will have say for instance uh, underscored words in the printed text uh, which yield the results so don't be put off if you if you um, <clears throat> if you come across those pages this means that the uh, simple search is a very wide and broad search which can make it fairly useful um, for um, for students when they access um, this resource and want to find information on a particularly broad topic. Um, so for instance, if we uh, search for the word war in the AOR corpus, both D and, and, and especially Harvey were in, interested in war and, and military strategies, um, we click on search and you can see that we have 160 search results. Um, this is uh, very nice and you know you can take your time to go through this list but one might want to uh, on the basis of this search result might want to narrow down the search a bit further um, in order to do so as Earl also already showed we can use the advanced search um, which allows us to search for particular words or particular marks or symbols um, and create a, a more complex query-based search. So for instance, we search here for war in the text of a marginal note, but we're not satisfied with that. We want to move it down a bit. We want to couple that to the search for a particular historical person, in this case, um, namely uh, Caesar. Um, <clears throat> in order to, as I said, narrow the search down a bit further. So what we're asking from the search here is now, return us pages in the whole AOR corpus, which have a marginal which contains war, and the marginal notes, which mentions the person Caesar. Um, right, we get uh, a number of search results here, which is, which is nice. And then one of the uh, advantages of the AOR viewer is that we can um, load this search result within this particular workspace as it's called but we also have the uh, possibility to open that search result in another workspace like I did here and this is uh, especially useful if you a have a very big screen which I don't have as you can see um, but it allows one to open multiple search results up to 25 I think and really start uh, comparing pages of different books and comparing uh, marginal notes. Okay, I'm going to close this down now. And I want to um, show something else, which is something similar. We again want to search for marginalia uh, war, uh, but then for a symbol. Both um, Harvey and, and Dee uh, used a, a, a set of symbols. Um, they use it in different ways, but often they use symbols to mark up passages in the printed text. So we can now search, for instance, for Mars. If I can find it, ah, here it is. Um, again, searching for marginalia on war and for the Mars symbol. 
um, in order to find, uh, possibly find um, marginalia which are clearly linked to, um, <clears throat> to the printed text the reader was interested in. Um, and then, for instance, we can immediately go to a page in Livy's History of Rome, uh, still the crown jewel of the, the AOR corpus. Interestingly, on this page, what we see is that Harvey and, and Dee, they made what we call internal references. So uh, they refer to other books or they refer to um, pages uh, within, um, within uh, a particular book they were reading. This is really interesting because it shows us which books were, um, so to speak, in conversation with one another, uh, but it also allows us to follow the pathways early modern readers took to their books. And what we did is to make these internal references, these links operational, so you can click on them, and then you have to the option to open um, the, the page to which is linked uh, in the same workspace, or as I showed before, open it in, in another workspace. Now, in order to um, single out, if you're interested in these kinds of internal references, what you can do is say, okay, we go to search again, and we want still focus on the topic of war, but we want to, to hunt down some of these internal references. Both Harvey and Dee often use um, the Latin supra or infra, or C above or C below. So then um, searching for um, supra or infra oh, um, will quickly provide you with a list of a number of these of these um, of these internal references. Um, what also happened is that um, these readers provided very detailed uh, references to a particular book or to a particular chapter within a book or a book within a book, as it sometimes was was done in early modern imprints. So what you then can quickly do um, in order to, as a shortcut to get to this information, simply search for the word book, which will also uh, look for the word book in the um, translations of marginal notes. And what you then see, for instance, which is interesting, in Fontana's Stratagems of War, references to uh, the book of uh, Jacopo di Porchia, an Italian soldier, the precepts of war, which was uh, often uh, referred to by Gabriel Harvey. So these are again some simple strategies to, to make use of the search, uh, combine a simple search with a more advanced search, and also make use of uh, the particular ways in which we decided to classify the data and also capture the data um, in the XML files. And then as Earl already showed, um, there is the possibility to export this um, as an a, a list of HTML links, which is especially useful if you want to continue your, your, your research another day and want to see, go back in time and see which pages you've looked at, but also which kinds of, of searches you have already done. Um, so that's another great benefit of having this, this export function. Um, so having said that, I think I have talked for long enough already, so I will hereby uh, hand over to Neil, who will more sort of reflect on the uh, pedagogical aspects of, of the resource that we have uh, created. Thank you. Thanks, Yeah. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Let's see, we'll put that up. So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. And picking up off of what Yap was saying, um, in the second phase of our project, when we were working with John Dee's books and we were developing more things in the viewer, uh, we started to have conversations about uses for the project and, and user groups for the project that kind of went beyond the core constituency of people who already knew what the history of reading was um, and probably already had a sense of what these books were about. Um, so as Yap mentioned, the Livy is the crown jewel in the AOR corpus for the first part of it um, because there was a specific article written about the way that Gabriel Harvey read it. Um, and so moving from a project that was built to kind of illustrate one reader's path through their books um, to incorporating multiple readers and multiple pieces of information really kind of had us think about, well, how do we get somebody else to use this for a different purpose? Um, and so teaching was really one of the more 
uh, I wouldn't say easy, but one of the more readily apparent uses. Um, so as we go through some of the resources for teaching with AOR, first of all, I want to say you do not have to be an expert to do it. That's kind of the point. Um, you do have to be an expert, to teach, but uh, you do not necessarily need to know everything about all of these books. Um, we realized there were two key strengths to the project. First of all, um, as we were saying, for students who may never have seen an annotated book before, um, the project is interactive. So we can show you a very high resolution image of a particular book. Um, you can manipulate it in ways that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do readily with a physical book. Um, but we've also layered information on top of it. So we had thought about ways of getting this material into a seminar room, having people talk about something on a page um, without necessarily having that be talking in the abstract. So if we were using AOR in a class, we can all discuss this. We can try and decipher some of the annotations, first of all, just to see what people think about how to read it, um, and then pop out additional information that kind of gives you gives you help in navigating the book. Um, so this layered information means that, like I said, the project, this page of the book is more interactive than it would be if it was just a flat digitized image. Um, but the second thing that is a real strength of the project, as we've, as both Earl and Yap have mentioned, are the linked data in it, the ability to export findings, um, and the stable URLs for every image. Um, that was something that we developed in the second phase of the project and is what's really made this kind of teaching exercise with, um, with AOR not just usable, um, but I think actually very advantageous. Um, because since you can save paths through the resource and searches, um, you have the ability to design things or use exercises that are very open-ended um, in addition to just being walkthroughs. And you don't have to be sitting over the shoulder of your students saying, now do this, now do this, now click this. Um, so if we go to the main website, so we're on the AOR WordPress site right now, and we go to this tab here that is how to use AOR. Um, as we scroll down, there's a lot of just general how-tos, and then there's the teaching pages here. Um, so what this allows you to do um, is if you are looking, and I imagine as some of you are, just for material to dive right into, um, there are nine separate topics um, at different levels um, for seminars, for secondary schools, um, and then even just some quick puzzles that these links will drop you into the viewer um, and you can either have a discussion in person or asynchronously um, or build assignments around the, um, around the resource. Um, these have all been built from the HTML export function um, and I'll show you a little bit how to do that um, in, in a second. But the other thing is that we had really intended this to encourage collaboration around the resource. Um, and so you have the ability, like I said, to take somebody by the hand and lead them, um, or you have the ability to kind of create an option, an open-ended sandbox for them to explore. So if we go to this particular exercise, um, which traces the way that John Dee read the history of England, um, all of these links will launch the pages in the viewer um, that pertain to uh, the task at hand. So if you look at this, you can kind of see the ways that he is trying to uh, reconcile the spelling of names um, from this supposedly fantastic voyage of the Trojans across um, the ocean to find, to found the island of Britain. Um, and we can see him kind of working with the material in a way that is very specific to him. Um, but fortunately for those of us who can't really decipher this, um, can start to kind of move into the English. Um, I will say that the export will give you a series of links. Um, so you can actually do as I've done here. Um, people will click these separately. 
Um, you can kind of give them prompts in the text um, or you can drop them into the viewer. Um, but they will kind of have to go back and forth through um, the material. Uh, it won't preserve the, the search history in this window. Um, so while as you're navigating the AOR resource um, in real time, if you're searching through it, you can use your browser's back and forward buttons um, for material that you're pulling out of an HTML export, um, you have to go to the list and link it. Um, we actually see on this last page of the exercise, D recording different areas that he's found other books, different people who have collections of material that are useful to others um, and actually useful to him, a family member who gave him a hint as to um, his own pedigree and then a notice of his death down here. Um, so there are topics to explore in all of these books that have to do with the history of reading, um, that have to do with the history of these authors, and then also that just have to do with the uses of books and topics. Um, so this exercise here is so, sort of a similar walkthrough, but it provides essentially a translation of a passage in the book that's being read so that somebody can follow the annotations in AOR and use the, the English translation side by side. Um, one of the things that we didn't capture in the AOR research um, was book material that was printed in the book. Um, we don't have translations of the texts that are in Latin, for example. Uh, we have translations of what was annotated. So in some ways we've made the annotations in the book very visible and we've kind of hidden the rest of the text. Um, these exercises at least will kind of help bring that back out and help walk a student or a group through um, a particular part of a book or a particular aspect. They're very good, like I said, for either kind of doing an intro to annotated books or intro to reading, um, or just giving out as assignments that people can follow stepwise outside of class time. Um, the ability to preserve searches um, has allowed us to kind of build more complex modules, more complex topics around the history of reading. Um, so this one actually looks at the ways it has four case studies of how our annotators dealt with different um, aspects of their books. Um, and it really allows you to compare the ways that they were working through it. Um, I only want to open one of these um, because basically this process here shows kind of how to refine a multi-term search. So in this search, I've really only looked at um, the annotations in a book that have these little notes on top. Um, this is ID, John D's signature. Um, and realizing that we he had done this um, in some annotations but not others um, is kind of a way of asking why sign why autograph annotations in a book that theoretically only you are going to read um, and we can see kind of through this search how John D adds knowledge or adds authority to his to his books um, so there are a number of exercises on the on the resource that look at you know the ways that marginalia and the printed word interact um, some of these, the seminar level ones, have suggested readings um, and are sort of designed to be full seminar classes or longer assignments. Um, down here, we have just some puzzles, um, some things that we had been unable to solve on our own. Um, for example, this one where D is talking about mathematical theory in this annotation. Um, we can decode the annotation, but we may not be able to actually figure out what he's talking about because none of us are mathematicians. Um, so these sort of <clears throat> collaborative problems that we can engage with um, using the viewer in real time, um, I think are also another good use of the resource um, as a basis for discussion, as a jumping off point um, for really investigating the lives that these books had. So very quickly, um, if I was in the reader, if I was in the viewer here, and I exported my, um, I exported my research, 
I just added a couple of pages here. So I have that one. I go through a few steps here in the Cicero. I open up another page and I click this. You can see that we have the ability here to also remove steps um, and to write little descriptions. So when you export this as an HTML file, um, you can give this material directly to your students, um, or you can use it as the basis for um, group explorations. If you wanted to open up four different pages of a book and have your students look at either of them to compare, um, or at the end of some of these exercises as we've built them, to just kind of go off and explore the view or to fall down that rabbit hole, um, you can build that in. Um, and kind of drop them into the resource with some guidance. Um, so these are all kind of different ways in to using the viewer for education. I wanna say a couple of things very briefly. Um, we are in the process of designing a subject guide. Um, Earl mentioned the different books by topic um, or different books in the corpus, but this we will post um, on our site and it should give you an idea of which of the books basically have um, their own uh, their own subject headings, um, and I'm not sure. I think I realize that if you guys can see this, um, it is um, a quick guide to the ways that the the subjects that are headed in the different books in the corpus. Um, we also have these visualizations of our data um, as possibly ideas to start searching on your own. Um, so I'd say pick one of these exercises, pick a, pick a topic and just jump right in, pick a cluster of books, um, but also think about ways that you can get out. Um, we didn't intend the, um, we didn't intend the resource to be a one-stop shop. Um, we knew that these, this is a small example of the books that are in Harvey and Dee's library um, and it shouldn't just be used by itself. So I think Matt will take the last part of the presentation and talk about the ways that we might pair AOR with different resources, um, either for your students or for your own research. Thank you, Neil. And yes, that's precisely what I intend to do over the next few minutes I have. Hello, everybody. Unlike the uh, photograph I also happily showed you earlier, you'll notice I have rather less hair pretty much anywhere on my face or indeed on the top of my head. Uh, but I'm co-PI on the AOR project. And now, as Earl said in his introduction, the project was built with a specific intellectual project at its heart, one based around Jardine and Grafton's uh, study for action, how Gabriel Harvey read his Livy. Uh, however, we knew from the first moment that any resource we created would have to be as open as possible uh, to other researchers, researchers who would inevitably have other research questions in mind. Throughout this uh, webinar, we've been demonstrating how AOR can show links across and within uh, our corpus or our, our micro corpus, if you like. But one important aim was to build in the ability to link outwards to other resources um, or what Earl, met, what Earl called external objects. So photographs of the books, uh, the links internally between one book and another that you can see within the IIIF viewer, we've called those internal objects and it's quite natural to go from one to the other. But we also have these external objects that we can move to moving outside the viewer and off our digital book wheel into other people's uh, researchers. So this includes other digitization efforts, uh, sometimes paywalled uh, and sometimes not. And apologies for those who are trying to follow along, can't follow me beyond any institutional paywalls uh, 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 for whatever reason. But much of what I'll be showing over the next few moments uh, will be free, uh, as in uh, free beer, uh, including other resources built with the same technology, the same IIIF technology. 
And now at a time when uh, my MA students are embarking on their 18,000 word research dissertations, uh, these are dissertations that on our program should demonstrate an intellectual engagement with archival or rare books collections. I'm aware of how important it is to be able to locate and move to other digital uh, artifacts online, other digital collections. Now, there are two prime examples of how we have um, built in, baked into the viewer, uh, these external resources. Uh, and I'm going to show one example relating to the people who uh, Harvey and Dee mentioned, and one relating to the books that they mentioned. Uh, here on my screen uh, is from the Detti et Fatti. Uh, it's one of my favorite books, and it's one of my favorite of Harvey's many comparisons. Uh, the Lord, it's in the center page here, the Lord Cromwell, a ball of fortune, and then here, the Lord Burley, a globe of fortune. Here is a comparison of two secretaries of state, both of whom command the vital place in both the information gathering regimes of two Tudor reigns, but also the historiographies of our period. And it's easy to imagine uh, our students building research dissertations upon one or the other. But how can we move outward away from Harvey's own comparison uh, towards other people? Let's use the example of Lord Burley and click on his name here. The third option here, uh, after the other options which would search within the same book or search within the collection for other mentions of Cecil Lord Burley, uh, takes us out of the viewer. That's what this little uh, arrow out of a box is telling us. And this takes us to um, the ISNI entry for William uh, Cecil. Uh, ISNI stands for International Standard Name Identifier. Uh, a global standard for identifying unique individuals, whether they are contemporary to us or whether they are historical. Um, anyone who has any experience of building a data set uh, will know the importance and time it takes to disambiguate uh, various different naming protocols, whether it's William Cecil, Lord Burley, whether it's in Latin or whether it's in another vernacular form. But the really handy thing about building this identifier in uh, to the IOR viewer is that it gives us some shortcuts. As you can see here, because the ISNI is very much baked in also to Wikipedia, there it brings us all the Wikipedia entries to Lord Burley. Now, <laughs> this, of course, may be slightly problematic for some of you, but it also handily builds it into Wikidata, the structured data uh, aspect of all the various Wikipedias uh, and Wikimedia instances. And if we click here, we can see this will bring us towards this sort of grounding site for all mentions of William Cecil for all uses. We immediately have his images of him. We have all the structured data that we can pull out of his various entries, but also very importantly, as we keep going down this list, past his various biographical details, is that it can also link us to other places where he is. And I'm just going to show you a few of these resources so that you can imagine using uh, AOR, using Wikidata to build a reading list around our subjects. So here is his Library of Congress Authority ID. We can open this in a new tab. And here we go for the Library of Congress linked data service, which not only has similar details about him, but will bring up, say, subject of works about Burley, uh, headed here by the uh, magisterial Stephen Alford biography, uh, and also a list of printed works uh, that, concern, uh, that concern Burley. Uh, or use him in some way. Another example going down 
this list uh, is his entry here at EMLO, Early Modern Letters Online. So this is one way we can move from the AOR world of printed books into manuscript and to find places, locations of much of his correspondence. Again, so long as it is contained within EMLO, we are always talking here about various resources that have more or less information in them, depending on their own very nature. But I think you can see that this is actually quite a helpful guide towards move to move forwards. Two others I would like to just mention to you quickly is, of course, uh, his entry in the National Portrait Gallery, which allows us to bring back images of Burley. at various stages of his career. The ODMB entry, and also his appearance in the wonderful Six Degrees of Francis Bacon, which allows us to see inside uh, his social network, as it were. That's taking far too long to load, so I shall stop. So that's how we can go from a person being mentioned in AOR from taking interest in that person to finding out more about them or finding or pushing towards a wider research agenda. We can also do something similar with books. Here in this comment uh, from uh, his copy, Harvey's copy of Livy, uh, he discusses Machiavelli's uh, discourses on Livy uh, and its place uh, within in other reading. He, for instance, here he um, advises people to go away and read uh, Johannes Valcurio's commentaries on Livy before you get to Machiavelli. But this allows us to link to the discourses on Livy. If we open up the link here, again, we can search through the book or search through the collection for other mentions of the discourse. Or this, our third option here, instead of opening the ISNI up, as we do in people. This also, this will open up the USTC, the Universal Short Title Catalogues entry uh, for uh, discourses uh, uh, on Livy by Machiavelli, in this case, uh, John Wolfe uh, edition. Now, why I like the USTC is not only does it bring back the bibliographical details of this, the USTC is extremely good at finding other digitized images of those books. So, of course, while this is a very famous book, there are many projects of digitization going on around the world, particularly in Germany and France. Incredibly rich uh, digitization efforts have gone on in those countries. And the USTC generally has a link there to a digital edition. Here, the link is via Procrest and via uh, Ebo, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. Uh, with online. So we've managed to go from AOR to finding a contemporary edition of a book. In this case, fortunately, we're out of rather than any free reason because it's because of the nature of Evo, it's a uh, uh, it's a it's a uh, commented annotated edition of it. But we've managed to move from stuff in AOR to stuff without AOR. I'd just like to end this talk by talking about something that's completely outside AOR, the Cambridge Digital Library, and something it has done similarly with a triple IF instantiation. Here is its research uh, project on Montaigne's library. So here is a similar uh, intellectual project to our own in some ways, but this is just rather easily putting things online. Again, though, with traditional triple IF technologies. So this doesn't have all the interactive things we've been showing to you, all the transcriptions, but it is here in IIIF form. And as I'm sure some people are aware, you can put together IIIF collections extremely well, as long as they have all been encoded in the correct manner. Cambridge University Library have been extremely good at using IIIF as part of their digital library. And not only that, they've indeed got this 
in their collection. Recently bought uh, at auction, here is another of Harvey's books. Uh, in this case, A Marvellous Discourse Upon the Life, Deeds and Behaviours of Catherine de' Medici. Signed there by Gabriel Harvey. So in this way, we have moved across resources um, from outside the AOR, but within the institutional framework of IIIF to build a research environment, uh, a research ecosystem to allow us to carry on our research into the world of annotated books during a time of social isolation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. This is Erin again. Um, that concludes today's webinar. Um, I will turn it over to Earl now to see if there's anything else he'd like to add before we close. Earl, are you still there? Well, in any case, I thank you all so much for joining us. I also extend my thanks to the presenters. This has been, I've learned so much about using the AOR and um, I welcome your questions. I have a few here in the chat and I'm also eager to receive any questions you have by email. Just send them to bsa at bibsokamer.org. Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.